So, uh, so hi everybody, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today and uh, once again it's time for our weekly space hangout, this time for February 16th, 2012. We've got uh, some collection of our usual cast of characters this week. We've got, uh, and again in no official order, just how I see them, we've got Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. We've got Dr. Ian O'Neill from Discovery Space. We've got Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. And Dr. Pamela Gay from Astronomy Cast. And, uh, and now we've got a special guest this week, which is awesome. Thanks to Emily for setting this up, which is uh, Alan Stern from NASA. And he's the, uh, I guess, the principal investigator for the NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. So we're going to do our regular roundup of uh, space news stories. And uh, Alan can jump in at any point and, uh, and provide his insights. And then I thought at the end, We'll take the time and, uh, and chat with Alan about New Horizons, ask them some questions, and then uh, open this up to people who are watching this if they want to ask any questions about Pluto and the Kuiper Belt and New Horizons and Pluto's planethood status, which I know Alan has a lot of opinions about, so, and I'm sure we'll hear them. So why don't we first get on to some of the, uh, the news this week. Um, so the, the first thing is the, and this is sort of the big one that we've all been covering, and this is the, the, uh, the new NASA budget that was released on Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday this week, uh, and had some just uh, very deep uh, cuts that were made to uh, various programs, especially Mars exploration. So Pamela, can you give us the overview on the, uh, on the budget? So this came out on Monday, February 13th, and... The, the press conference started off on a note that I think got several of us kind of happy. There was a beautiful showcase video. They highlighted keywords like education was one that made me happy, I'm like my programs are safe. And then we learned that all because something is shiny and appears in the video doesn't mean it's safe. So the, the overall budget uh, only down a little over $60 million. But what ended up happening was the James Webb Space Telescope somewhat acted like a giant vacuum cleaner. Uh, in order to get it ready for launch, in order to make sure that the program was secure, its budget was increased by 21%. So that was a huge jump. And in order to make that happen, other programs had to suffer. We lost the ExoMars mission, which there had been some hints in the rumor mill was coming. I don't think anyone was surprised, but I think a lot of people were extremely unhappy because this was a mission where we basically went to the European Space Agency a number of years ago and said, look, let's join forces, let's do this together, let's do this right. There was several years of very focused negotiations to make sure everything kept going. And then we just basically yanked the rugs out from underneath our European colleagues after all of these years of planning, said, nope, not going to do it, which essentially canceled their missions as well. So, so ExoMars died. We saw a total of 20.6% reduction in planetary funding. Astrophysics didn't do too badly. It's down 2%. Heliophysics actually went up 4%. And the big winner was actually funding going to commercial space, funding going uh, to Kennedy Space Flight Center to help get it ready to facilitate commercial launches. And we're seeing lots of energies getting redirected where NASA is no longer planning to do all of its own space launches. It's instead reaching out to the commercial space agencies and incentivizing space, making it uh, more tasty for these commercial companies to come in and partner with NASA and say, hey, instead of paying the Russians, let's work together and you can pay us to work here in America launching, rush launching rockets for you to get to the International Space Station. And there's definitely a lot of uh, of still a lot of importance put on a, on the new launch uh, the new launcher that was the SLS. There's the yeah. um, there's they're still working on the Orion capsule and they're still moving all that towards being able to do some test launches within right. the next couple of years. But uh, it's definitely especially for for exploration of Mars. I think Phil mentioned that in his post. Mm -hmm. Too bad he's not here. I'm sure he'd go off. Uh, but they, they dropped 38% on the exploration of, of Mars. So it's a deep cut. Those people have got to be really frustrated. Now, you know, looking at the budget in detail, one thing I did see that kind of made me happy is there's actually two million removed from center management and operations, which says that they were willing to take cuts 
on the administration side of things as well as on the science and mission side of things. So this was an across the boards tightening. The, the one thing that made me, I think, the saddest is the unfortunately the education budget dropped from 136 million down to just a flat 100 million. And so a lot of the projects that the folks on, on this show have been engaged on in a variety of ways are, are going to actively suffer. Yeah, I'm sure it's Alan. And, and a point. Oh, go ahead. In. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I've done a pretty thorough analysis of the uh, president's budget request that came out on Monday and spoken to leaders at NASA headquarters who I used to work with. And really, the attack on planetary science is much broader than just Mars, not to minimize the hit to the Mars program, but Lunar Quest is zeroed. Yeah. Uh, the Discovery program flight rate is cut in half. The New Frontiers program flight rate is cut essentially in half. Uh, the Outer Planets program consists of studies for the next five years, no new starts whatsoever, and uh, quite a number of operating missions, even those that are still in prime mission, such as New Horizons that we'll talk about later, are receiving cuts. It's really an across-the-board attack on planetary science. Now, you describe it as an attack. I mean, would you say that it's, you know, is one of these situations where it's like political inside about which projects are getting funded and which ones are not? I mean, attack, is that the sort of way you describe it? Well, we can use a different word for it, but the Earth science budget is not, not affected. Yeah. Uh, the astrophysics budget uh, is, is not affected when you include James Webb. As we were saying earlier, it's going way up, the total astrophysics effort. Um, the heliophysics budget is in good shape. Uh, all, of the, all of the cuts that are paying for James Webb and other things in the agency are being focused in the S and B side, purely within the planetary division. That's just and, arithmetic. Yeah, and so what do you think is the core cause? I mean, do you think it's it's James Webb going over budget? Is it, you know, Curiosity going over budget? Is it because I mean, there should have been a lot of money coming back in. I mean, if you look at the funds in the budget for like the the uh, the space shuttle, it's all nicely going to zero as expected. So that should have freed up a lot of funds. Right, and it has, and those funds are being used to build uh, the Space Launch System, the new Saturn V class rocket. They're going into human exploration for building the Orion crew exploration vehicle, those kinds of things. S&D's budget is about flat, uh, and so uh, none of that human spaceflight money came back into science. It all stayed within the human spaceflight program. And I don't think that Curiosity is the problem anymore. It was a problem a while back. It slowed up discovery and new frontiers that affected the lunar program, but we're past that now. It's in flight and its big spending is over. Um, uh, really, when you live in a zero-sum game, in order to pay for some increase in a program, uh, you have to take that from those who didn't cause the problem, and that's what's going on here. One of the things that really struck me looking at the budget is when you look at the entire national budget, this is the first time NASA's budget has been less than half a percent of the U.S. budget. and um, just the, the idea that we're spending that little money on NASA is something that disturbs me. Um, now we're all sad. Um, but why don't we move on to, uh, to some of the other stuff. So, so uh, Emily, you have a cool story on a uh, new super high resolution map of the moon provided by the Chang'e. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. This, so this is a Chinese lunar orbiter that has actually now departed the moon and, and is in the Sun-Earth L2 point. It's, uh, it's completed its lunar mission. But last week, they, or two weeks ago, they released a global map of the moon at a resolution of 50 meters per pixel. Now, 50 meters per pixel is not what I would describe as super high resolution, but for a global map, it's actually the, the best that's out there. And um, a friend of mine, Phil Stook, from the University of Western Ontario, did a comparison of the Chang'e 2 um, 50 meter global map to the current best uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter wide angle camera global map of the moon and found that the two compare very favorably. The um, Chinese one has slightly higher resolution and slightly higher sun angles, which is great for looking at polar terrains. But of course, what Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has that the Chinese one doesn't is the embedded incredibly high resolution detail from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. Um, 
and he looks at several very interesting areas on the moon where you can see the advantages and uh, that each of these different kinds of data products has in covering the moon and it just so shows you that it really is useful to get multiple global products from different spacecraft with different capabilities because each one of them can be used to answer different kinds of questions or to look into areas such as shadowed areas and near polar um, lunar craters which are um, uh, difficult to see into in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Global Map, but which you can actually see into with the Chinese map. One thing I want to clarify is that when this map was released, there were some Chinese press releases that talked about a 7 meter resolution map, which would be, I think, super high resolution. But I think that those um, that that was a misunderstanding. I think that what was released was a 50 meter global map with detail areas at 7 meters. Um, so there, there, I don't believe there is a 7 meter global map. I think that it's kind of like Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter where there's the lower resolution global product and then the high resolution details. But anyway, it's great you know, that to have this whole new global data set for the moon. It's a beautiful map and I hope to see more lunar scientists using it as base maps for their lunar projects. How open and available are the Chinese with giving access to the data for their moon map? I mean, the, you know, we're all really lucky when we have NASA because we can just access all their stuff on all their servers and use it however we want. Are they making this stuff as available as NASA does? Well, um, not exactly, but, it, but with this particular map, it is really very easy to get. You can get it by FTP. You just go download it. So um, it's very easy. Um, it's very easy to get. It's not in the same um, exact format and folder structure as we're all very used to with NASA um, data, but um, I certainly have no I, I downloaded it in a matter of a couple of hours and, and was ready to start playing with it. So it's, it's definitely available for the public and for researchers. Right, so they're definitely not preventing or limiting access to the map of the data itself. No, not, not in this case. No, that's really cool. Uh, so what, what do you think scientists will be able to do with a map of this kind of resolution? Well, um, at, as with anything, it glo global maps give you the ability to um, to uh, do comparative analysis of similar kinds of features across the entire lunar landscape. You zoom out, you get the context. This, this kind of map gives you context that you don't have if you don't have this kind of global map product. Um, the other thing that it allows you to do is it helps you orient yourself in space with the much higher resolution detail products that you get from, from other instruments. So it's, it's very useful to have something like this. And because it's done at a high sun angle, you get a lot more information on varying color, or at least albedo, that is brightness and darkness on the surface, where most of the other global products have been more geared toward understanding the topography. So there's a, um, a, a steeper cycle that throws shadows, which makes it much easier to see like crater rims and, um, and valleys and things like that. But it's harder to see the, the brightness of the surface. And this map it's, is very nice for brightness, less nice for topography. So it's a trade-off. That's awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Emily. Uh, now, Ian, you've got a cool story on Discovery uh, this week about a Swiss plan to remove space junk. Yeah, and it's been causing a bit of a stir, certainly in the UK. I was asked to be on um, Radio 5 Live on the BBC last night, and it seems to have reinvigorated <laughs> the discussion on space junk. I, just, I, I love your title. Hold on. It's Swiss to grab the world's biggest space problem by its junk. That uh, I, I cannot believe you, uh, you know, the, the sensors at Discovery let you post that. But. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were allowed to push the envelope a little bit. <laughs> I mean, that's about as far as I could push it. But, uh, yeah, there was a lot of discussion as to whether I should do that because nobody was in the office at the time. Yeah. So I didn't really know where to go to. So it was a bit of a judgment call. But, yeah, so, so this little experiment in um, by the Swiss uh, Space Center actually and you know Switzerland one of the smallest nations in the world they're trying to tackle a global issue and I think that's really the take-home message here they're trying to find a solution to the space junk issue which is a growing problem and they are doing it in a cost-effective way and basically um, it's, um, it's, it's a university-based project, so it's not like, you know, got massive um, ESA funding or anything like that. Basically, they're proposing to launch um, small football-sized, um, like, CubeSats. And so, basically, they'll be put into orbit, and they will be sent, I assume, or, or they're going to be automated. They're going to track down a target of space junk, probably about a similar size as itself, because NASA tracks around about 20,000 chunks of space junk over four inches wide, 
um, and there's millions of smaller pieces, but the, the larger pieces we can actually do something about, and this is what this Swiss team are hoping to do. So they will send this um, space junk grabber into space, and using ion engines, it will coast its way towards the, its target, and it will use a, um, a kind of a grappling uh, mechanism to surround its target, and basically then it will steer it and pull it back down into the Earth's atmosphere and it will burn up with its target. So basically the way they're, they're proposing is to have many, many disposable grabbers they're going to send into orbit, and they're going to track down their, their orbital prey, their, uh, their little space junk targets, wrap around them and bring them down from space. Now, as we know, this is a growing issue at the moment. I mean, obviously, there's um, a lot more um, consideration for space junk, but in the past, and certain recent events have actually increased the amount of space junk in orbit. And some high-profile events, in like in 2007, the Chinese blew up their, their communication satellite to test their anti-satellite anti weaponry, and that produced, like, tens of thousands more bits of space junk in, in Earth orbit. And there are more and more events, like we got to move the International Space Station every now and again. They got boosted out of the way of a significantly sized piece of space junk. So there is increased awareness of this. And I think by taking a very a cheap approach, because there's lots of big ideas to remove space junk from orbit, but you try and get half of those funded, you won't. Whereas this small group have gone in with a very basic idea and they're hopefully going to implement it in a very affordable way using off-the-shelf technology. I mean, they can have a few hurdles along the way, obviously, and this is only its infancy. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But it certainly raises awareness and people are actually talking about it again, so it's good. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it sounds like it would be phenomenally expensive to try and launch enough of these little creatures to to catch enough of the space junk to make a big difference, but I suspect that a lot of the things that they would be learning would have application in, in all kinds of other things, like orbital docking and retrieving spacecraft, repairing spacecraft, and even, you know, mining asteroids. So I think there's yeah. a, definitely a lot of interesting science to go there, but I could just, just can't imagine. I mean, if there's, you know, 10,000 pieces of space junk worth retrieving at yeah, a thousand dollars per vehicle. I mean, and that's really that the discussion. Up. It's like you know, because um, space is all about sustainability these days, and people are saying, you know, why are you sending these high tech little robots in space just for them to get destroyed? But that's really the main point of this project is to try and make it affordable, try and make it um, a cheap endeavor. So you could imagine sending out perhaps a satellite which is composed of a hundred of these little cubes that will separate and do their own thing. It's kind of you know science fiction at the moment, but they're actually going to put a prototype into space. Their first project is going to be this prototype that they're going to send up, and they're actually going to have a, um, its target is going to be the first Swiss satellite that's currently in orbit. It's actually another CubeSat, probably about the same size, about this size. And it's going to chase it down, wrap around it, and bring it down, just as a proof of concept that this thing can work. Then I think if they can prove it just with this one prototype, I think there will be sponsors for this. I mean, if it, they can prove that they can do it using their mechanism. And probably the, the, the kind of it, creepy thing about the, the video is that the, um, the, gra the grabber that actually comes out from the CubeSat is a very, um, has a very natural look to it. It's almost like a, um, a carnivorous plant wrapping around its prey. So they're taking a few hints from nature here. And I think that's kind of cool. So. Yeah, keep an eye on it. I mean, if anything, it's raising awareness. I don't know how far down the line they're looking at. They're looking at getting their prototype in space and within a, a five-year time scale. But who knows? But it's getting people talking, and I think it's really raising awareness for an increasingly sticky problem for space agencies. That's awesome. All right, and uh, and Nancy, uh, last but not least, we've got a cool video from from you with uh, NASA astronauts shaking hands with their. Uh, robot pals on the International Space Station. Yeah, yesterday was a, a giant leap for robot kind on board the space station. And uh, we have a video of it here. Let me uh, share that with you. And um, so uh, the robonaut, uh, robot, robot that's on board the International Space Station was being checked out yesterday. And there he is shaking hands with uh, Expedition 30 Commander Dan Burbank. And uh, it, it, was, it was pretty fun to watch, and, and they've been checking out Robonaut uh, for the past, uh, well, the past two days they have been. 
And uh, interestingly enough, the robonaut also signed in sign language, hello world, although he wasn't quite facing uh, right at the, at the camera. So, uh, and, uh, but anyway, uh, we also have a video on Universe Today if you want to see our article of kind of the different uh, capabilities that Robonaut has and, you know, he can flip switches and push buttons and uh, basically the Robonaut is there to do kind of some menial tasks that the, ro that the um, astronauts, you know, that they re wouldn't necessarily have to do so they could focus on more science. Now, c can they send him outside the space station? No, this one is not set to go outside. He's just an indoor, indoor robot. <laughs> indoor pet, right? Yeah. But you can imagine in the future that'd be really handy to be able to have one connected outside. Always, right. well, the, well, there always is hoping Dexter. to get in, but never allowed to come in, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there is Dexter, the big uh, dexterous robotic arm outside, and uh, he can actually do some tasks. And they're actually getting ready to have that robot do more things. Um, there's a, a module that's being prepared to be sent up probably, I think, in about a year or so, and that would allow the astronauts to... Uh, put items kind of in an airlock and and shut the door and then the robonaut could or um, Dexter could grab them and uh, like install different things outside of the state and if if that's needed that sounds really cool well why don't we why don't we get to the meat of uh, of this week's uh, weekly space hangout and uh, and talk with with Alan Stern about Pluto and New Horizons. So, so thanks again, uh, Alan, for for joining us this week. Really appreciate it. I know you're busy, especially with uh, with all of the budgetary stuff that's coming up. So, can you give us then a bit of a background on on New Horizons and and your work on investigating Pluto? Sure. And thanks for having the, having New Horizons on the show. Uh, uh, I think everybody probably knows the New Horizons, Horizons is a robotic spacecraft that was launched. Uh, six years ago, in January of 06, uh, a very large Atlas V booster, uh, and is on its way uh, to explore Pluto and then the Kuiper Belt. This is the first mission, not just to Pluto, but also to dwarf planets, the first mission out into the Kuiper Belt. It's, in fact, the only outer planets mission on its way to a target right now. Of course, we have Cassini uh, orbiting Saturn, but uh, uh, Cassini and New Horizons are our outer planets program with Juno, uh, going to the uh, giant planets to orbit Jupiter a um, little bit after New Horizons. We'll be arriving in just over three years uh, and making a flyby reconnaissance, which will actually be pretty intensive for about six months. From January through July, we'll be studying the Pluto system on the way in and also as we recede from the system. We have a whole slew of uh, instruments on board, eight scientific instruments, all super advanced compared to uh, Voyager class. And the spacecraft's in great health. It's got plenty of fuel. It's doing really well. We've traveled 22 astronomical units out of 32 that we have to travel. So we have just, just a little bit less than 10 AU to go. And um, we're starting to gear up for the encounter. So how, I, I think, you know, it, there was a bit in the beginning where we had it go past... Uh, or a buzz there. Oh, I had a bit in the beginning where it went past Jupiter. We got some great images of Jupiter and some really cool images of like volcanoes blasting off of Io. And then, you know, some not a lot, you know, some, some photos from New Horizons of Pluto, some pictures back at Earth, but, you know, a lot of sort of in between time of this, of this great travel time. But I know that as we get closer to, to, to the actual arrival, things are going to get pretty complicated because you've really, it's all just down to this flyby. So can you let us know how things are going to play out for people over the next couple of years so they can sort of set their calendars? Yeah, sure. Uh, Fraser, absolutely. And you're right. You know, this is a mission of delayed gratification. There's no question. The solar system is just an enormous place. And even though we were the fastest spacecraft ever launched, we launched so fast that, you know, Apollo astronauts used to travel to the moon with a 25,000 mile per hour speed. It took three days to get to the moon. We did it in point three days, nine hours on the way out. We got to Jupiter 13 months later. Compare that to Galileo, more than six years to get there. We are barreling across the solar system, but it's a very large place. So we knew from the beginning we had this eight-year period between Jupiter and Pluto where we had to take good care of our spacecraft and plan the encounter. But, you know, we don't pass anything along the way. It's really a soldier's journey, if you will. But um, on approach, we begin in January 2015, a little less than three years from now. 
and we have three approach phases. A very distant approach phase, where there's not much science, but we begin to do optical navigation to home in. Uh, we let our instruments take their first look at the Pluto system, uh, and we do some, um, some searches for satellites. But they're not even as good as the searches we can do with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it gets a lot better around April. At that point, we can exceed the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, and the images that we send back um, will be better than anything that exists today. And by the time that we get late in the encounter, we'll have images of Pluto and spectra and temperature maps and things like that coming to the ground. And then we have a very intensive nine-day period called the core of the encounter uh, centered on closest approach when the spacecraft will be busy virtually 24-7, making literally hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of observations of Pluto and each of its satellites, even looking to discover more satellites or rings in the system. We won't be spending a lot of time sending that data back to Earth because we're going to be busy while we're there training the instruments on Pluto. We'll send a little bit of data back on approach the final few days, but really the torrent begins about four days after encounter. And in fact, it takes us about a year to get everything back. And and because it's a flyby, I mean, a lot of the, when people think about a lot of these missions, they think about like Cassini, for example. It's orbiting Saturn, and so it's just staying there, and it's getting constant images of the planet and the moons. But in this case, you you know, there's no way to make a you know enough of a velocity change to actually go into orbit. So you're going to have to just sweep right past. Are you going to be able to image the entire object? Yeah, we will image um, all of Pluto and Charon that are sunlit as they rotate, and all of the smaller moons as well. There are some permanently shadowed terrains because of um, the season that we're at, just like you know, Antarctica uh, is permanently shadowed in the winter. If, if you showed up on a flyby of the Earth in the winter, you couldn't map those terrains. But we're going to be mapping um, everything that's out there that's available to us. And in fact, we're even doing some, I think, pretty clever things. One is we brought along a very long focal length telescope. It's called LORI for the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager that lets us not only start a lot further out so we have a long encounter, but also when we actually get to Pluto, we're going to have nearly Landsat class resolution with that imager. So if we were flying over the Earth at the same altitude and looking down on um, my home of Boulder, Colorado here, uh, you would not only see uh, the city and the street network, but you would see individual blocks and large buildings and see their shape. So it's pretty pretty amazing ability. We also have the ability to image the night side of Pluto after we pass by in reflected Charon light. And uh, that's going to be very important for looking at where frosts deposit on the cooler night side. Tell us something about both the meteorology and the climatology. Well, I think, you know... I just got to interrupt you there to say how... I just got to interrupt you there to see how incredibly awesome it is to think about the fact that we can see the night side of Pluto in reflected light off of Pluto's moon. I mean, I've gotten used to seeing that on Cassini's images of Saturn's moons, but Saturn's a very big thing to reflect light from. You've got to be an incredibly sensitive instrument to be able to see the night side of an object that is so far from the sun by light reflected off of an even smaller object. I, you're right, Emily. It, it does take a sensitive camera, but there's, there's something that a, a lot of people probably don't appreciate unless they do the calculation, because Charon is much closer to Pluto, only 20,000 kilometers. It's really large in the sky, and when you actually do the calculation, if you ask how bright is Charon light, a full Charon moonlight on Pluto, it turns out it's almost as bright as two full moons here on the Earth. So you could read a book if you're on Pluto in a spacesuit. Right? Just like on a camp out. You could read a book at night by Sharon Light, which is a pretty cool thought. So what would you say are the big scientific questions that, that you're going to be answering? I mean, I think the most important things that we'll finally have, you know, we always have these images of the solar system. We've got beautiful photos of everything. And then when you get to that object of Pluto, you've got just like the best resolution from the Hubble Space Telescope or artist depictions. But we'll finally be able to have the actual photographs and put those into these books and be, you know, be done. And finally, we've completed the whole set. But, but I mean, you know, the science is obviously the, the key here. So what are the big scientific questions you're going to be answering? Well, Fraser, you know, when I was a boy, I watched the first age of planetary exploration, and it was spectacular to see the first missions to Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Mercury, the first landings on the moon. And what I remember is um, uh, the, the, the scientists, the principal investigators in those days made a lot of predictions that turned out to be wrong. 
mostly we underestimated nature. You know, no one expected Mars to have river valleys and be the complex world it is, and we didn't expect, for example, Venus to be completely resurfaced in the recent past, or Mercury to be all core. No one expected volcanoes in the outer solar system, but we found them the first time we went to go see icy satellites um, with Jupiter. And so what we know about the New Horizons is that it's dangerous to make predictions that nature will probably blow our socks off. And we designed the mission from the start not to go after targeted uh, specific questions like you would on a modern-day Mars mission, which would be the 20-something mission to Mars, or Juno, the ninth mission to Jupiter, with very targeted investigations. We're going in eyes wide open with instruments that were designed to do very basic things, map the planet and its satellites in their entirety, map their surface composition at every pixel on these objects to map the temperature fields. So we have the surface and the, the temperature as well, the temperature maps, to look for more satellites, to look for uh, signs of debris fields, uh, to study uh, the, the masses of the objects so we can recover their densities from also knowing their, their volume, to do a whole variety of very basic things to assay the atmospheric composition and the temperature pressure structure with altitude. This is the first time we're traveling to a dwarf planet. This is the most populous class of planet in the solar system. It's really on the frontier. And so we're going in to take these very basic data sets and let them inform us what the really cool science is. We just don't know, and that's the exciting part. Right, and then that'll be for the follow-up missions for the other 15 missions to Pluto following, right? Uh, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, now, like you said, you know, we're doing this really quick flyby. So we're gonna, you're going to gather as much information as you can in the you know days leading up to and afterwards, and then you're going to be you know, and then Pluto and and its moons will become disappearing dots in the you know in the rearview mirror again. So, what will be then next for New Horizons? Well, we have plenty of fuel, and the spacecraft and the instruments were designed to operate all the way to the far edge of the Kuiper Belt. Um, at 50 AU. In fact, we have enough fuel on board and enough power in the RTG to fly almost to 100 astronomical units. So um, we're going to write an extended mission proposal, and that will be to um, study objects in the Kuiper Belt. After Pluto, we hope to fly by at least one ancient KBO or Kuiper Belt object and get up close and personal with it on another flyby. We also know that we should be able to make much higher resolution studies of the satellite systems of Kuiper Belt objects from being there in the Kuiper Belt than any telescope back on Earth, even the Hubble. So while we're in cruise through the Kuiper Belt, we'll be making astronomical observations of quite a number of KBOs. And we hope to fly by one. If we get very lucky, we may have enough fuel to fly by two. But uh, I, I wouldn't really bet on two, but there's a chance for that. And then we'll also be studying the environment out there. We have space plasma instrumentation and a dust detector uh, that can inform us uh, quite a bit about the kinds of phenomenology that Voyager's been studying uh, at the termination shock in the distant outer solar system. And also, because we have a dust detector, we can learn about the collision rates between objects in the Kuiper Belt. We can map the distribution of hydrogen and helium in the heliosphere way out there. Uh, who knows what we'll be able to do because we're actually going to be asking for proposals for how would you use New Horizons to make observations while we're in cruise across this expanse of the, um, the solar system's last continent, if you will, the Kuiper Belt. So now I know we've got some questions piling up from, from people in the, uh, in the comment section who are watching the show, but I know as well a few people here in the Hangout have a couple of questions too. So uh, Ian, you've got a question or was this from your readers? Yeah, hi Alan. Um, one recurring question we're getting on, on Discovery News from our readers, and I think it was since we wrote a blog about your comments, I think it was back in um, November 2011, it was a mission update, and you mentioned that in light of the discovery of the two new moons um, around Pluto, that there could be the presence of a dust ring or a dust cloud. Now, I believe you had a, a workshop with a lot of experts to discuss this issue. I'm just wondering how far along um, this is going and what other um, observatories are helping out with this, um, this, this, this search for a possible um, hazardous uh, dust in, in Pluto orbit. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Ian. Um, we didn't really appreciate the hazards um, in the Pluto system until last summer when this new satellite, P4, was discovered. 
uh, maybe we should have thought about it more when Nix and Hydra were discovered because any of these small satellites um, uh, uh, produce the same phenomena, and that is whenever they're pelted by something in the Kuiper Belt, and that happens all the time, it's a very collisional environment, they don't have very much gravity, so the things that spray out as ejecta from those craters get into orbit around Pluto. And in fact, because the orbit speeds are low, they're like the ejecta speeds, you get a three-dimensional tarball of ejecta. It's not even a planar ring system. And we're traveling very fast. At Pluto, we'll be going 14 kilometers per second. That's approaching 10 miles per second. So even if we're hit by something as small as a milligram, it will shred the spacecraft. That's the end of mission. And because we're recording data on board for later transmit, you'll never see those images if we get hit. It'll just be no contact. So we can't afford to take a, take a chance. Therefore, we're now mounting a very large ground-based campaign with proposals to Keck, to Subaru, to Gemini, to all the big gun telescopes of the world to go and look. But it's really tough. So we're also proposing to Hubble for time because Hubble being above the Earth's atmosphere gives us some enormous advantages. And we're planning a campaign on approach, very high stakes, you could call it last minute, lots of drama on the way in with our LORI instrument because we can detect things on the way in that even Hubble can't. And if we see satellites down inside of Pluto's orbit, for example, or dust belts or rings or a big spherical halo of dust that could hurt us, we have planned something called a bailout trajectory. It's actually called the Safe Haven Bailout Trajectory with the acronym SHABBAT. And we can fire our engines onto that safer trajectory up to days before closest approach, switch the computer load out for a different encounter plan, which would go further from Pluto. And uh, although the science wouldn't be as good, it's very important that we, we uh, recognize that getting something is better than getting nothing. And if the object of our affection, the Pluto system, is actually a black widow and it's poised to kill us, then we need to outsmart it. Um, also, was there discussion about aiming towards the orbit of Sharon? Was there, um, because Sharon will be um, cleaning its orbit as it goes around Pluto, so would that make sense? Would that make a, a good window for it to plunge through? Right, so that you're, you're on top of this. Uh, uh, we're actually, uh, in addition to looking at where we're going now for hazards, we're also evaluating where to send this, ourselves on that Shabbat trajectory, and there are several candidates. Um, the easiest candidate is just to go far from Pluto, but that hurts the science the most. If we go twice as far out as any satellite that we know of, we should be safe, but we're pretty far out. Um, a clever idea that we've worked on since the beginning is to go straight into the belly of the beast at Sharon's orbit, because Sharon is a really large object. It's a planet-scale object, um, 1,200 kilometers across with you know, a, a kilometer per second escape speed that sweeps a region, a torus, clean over and over every time it comes around every six days. So the thought there is if we go right down through um, where Sharon has just been, that may be one of the safest places we could go, but we're not sure. The modelers can tell us uh, really smart things, but until we go and look with these big gun telescopes in space and on the ground, I'm not going to put my billion dollar baby at risk. All right, well, let me see if i got some, some questions now. So just remember, if you're watching this show on, uh, on Google+, you can post a question into the comments, and we'll try and, uh, and jump on those. As well, if you're watching this on cosmoquest.org slash hangouts, um, you can also tweet a question there, and I think uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on those questions. So, um, Hey, Fraser. Yeah. What do you think? Which was that? We, ha we haven't Change. talked oh. about the stamp for oh, yeah. of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. The change.org's right, petition of course, of to get course. a stamp. That was, that was right. That was our, that was our, our um, <laughs> the important part. Right, so you've <laughs> got plans to try and get uh, New Horizons on a U.S. stamp, right? We do. You know, um, uh, uh, one of the things that really got a lot of press uh, back in the 90s about Pluto was when the stamp set for the commemorating the, the exploration of the planets came out, and every planet had its, you know, its first spacecraft there except Pluto that said not yet explored. And Rob Staley and his JPL team made a big deal out of that. And even though that's not a scientific motivation, it sticks in people's minds. It's very human. Yeah. We're even flying one of those old stamps um, right back to Pluto just to put it in its face. But 
um, to fix that situation, um, we are petitioning the U.S. Post Office for a, for a new stamp. This is a concept painted by a space scientist and space artist, Dan Durda. And um, you can go to change.org. One of the things the Post Office requires is that every stamp come with a petition to show that not just the petitioners, but actually the American public is interested in having a stamp like that that they could use on envelopes and they could collect, etc. And so if you go to change.org and put in the search box Pluto, you'll have an opportunity to help, to click on the button and uh, be a signer, as uh, over 5,000 people now have. But our goal is really high. We want to get 100,000 people, which is almost unheard of. And we might not make that goal, but we can if people tell their friends. And if their friends tell their friends, and this goes a little bit viral. So we're asking for everybody's help. So everyone watching this right now should just take a second, open up another tab, go to change.org, search for Pluto, um, and uh, sign that petition. We'll wait. <laughs> and then, and as uh, soon as you've done that, as click as you've done on that. the Facebook and Twitter buttons that are there so that it goes to all your friends um, on those two big social networks. All right. Well, you keep us posted on how many you need, and we'll just keep... Uh, uh, letting people know until until ninety five thousand to go ninety five thousand to go so it's okay. so it's definitely important that you all work on it now <laughs> that is awesome um, uh, so I guess Stephen uh, Ut asked a question sort of what I asked he said are there any potential follow on targets known for New Horizons yet there are not we're conducting a ground based search and what makes it hard is twofold one the the Kuiper Belt objects are, are, there are lots of them, but there's a very large volume of space, and the ones that we can reach with our fuel supply are pretty small, 40, 50 kilometers across probably, like the asteroid Eros that the NEAR mission flew to. So those are far away and small, and that makes them faint. It takes the largest telescopes on Earth to find them, and as luck would have it, um, the, the place where we're going, the place where Pluto is and the space behind it, that part of the Kuiper Belt is in the worst possible place to go search because it's in Sagittarius, the, the heart of the galactic star fields, the center of the galaxy, where there's a lot of background confusion from, I'll uh, use a technical term, a zillion background stars. And it's, it's really a tough problem, but John Spencer's leading that project for us on New Horizons. He's got a really talented team of observers and uh, uh, data reduction experts from Harvard Smithsonian, from Southwest, from Lowell Observatory, a whole slew of institutions. They're going at it really hard. But you know, what I tell people in public talks is, if instead of going to Pluto in 2015, and then the Kuiper Belt, if I was going to Paris 2015, it's 2012 and somebody asked me where I was going to have dinner, which restaurant, I'd say, I don't know yet. But you know, I know there's plenty of restaurants and we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And Pamela, aren't you involved a bit with, with uh, helping find Kuiper Belt objects? Right. So we, we're just in the process of closing out a project called Ice Hunters that uh, invited people to look at the 2004, 5, and a bit of the 2011 data that John Spencer's team, um, most specifically Mark Bowie, has taken, um, and to go through the images and try and look for the things that appeared that weren't in um, matched images. So this is kind of hard to explain. The way, the way I look at it is, imagine you have two images. You line them up and you subtract them. And something that moved between the two images will appear as dark in, in one of the images and bright in the other image due to the subtraction process. And all the stuff that didn't move, all the stars, those just mostly disappear. Now due to atmospheric things, they actually turn into small donuts, which is a bit annoying. And because the atmosphere is constantly changing, you can't effectively get a computer to find 100% of these transient, these moving, these changing in brightness objects. So we ask humans. And we're actually asking the public. Now, Ice Hunters is just finishing up. I actually have software running right now that's producing the catalogs. That should be going up probably in the next three or four days. But we're getting ready to start a new project. And this new project is actually going to much more tightly constrain how well people are doing. Uh, Mark Bowie's team is going to be taking the images and not just giving us the images that contain real KBOs, but they're also inserting 
artificial ones. And what this does is it tells us, okay, we know that human beings can find all of the computer-generated Kuiper belt objects down to this brightness. We know they can find them down to this brightness. So we'll be able to say specifically what we're finding, and more importantly, what we're not finding, so we can figure out how to go back and look for those things. So that project's going to be coming as soon as the data is done. We're expecting probably mid to mid March to late March on that one. Right. And so and people want to get. Can, oh, go ahead. If I could jump in, I just want to say um, uh, thanks to Pamela and the Ice Hunters team. It's a lot of fun having public participation in this mission, but it's also actually really helpful. We we could not afford. Uh, to bring that many eyeballs to the table, and they have been spectacular. And we're going to have more data for you soon. We're proposing to more telescopes for Kuiper Belt search time this summer. And so stay tuned. And Pamela, thanks for all your help. It, yeah. It's my pleasure. And all of you who want to figure out how to get involved, it's all going to be coming to CosmoQuest. And I will be asking Alan to come back and talk to us along with his science team when sure. we're getting ready for all of this to launch. Perfect. So we've got people combing the restaurants in Paris for you right now, yes. trying everything. And then we'll let you know what's, uh, what's good and what's bad. This is truly the Lonely Planet's guide. <laughs> um, uh, there was another question here. So when do you think, uh, when will we, we will get pictures? Oh, I want to get the person who asked this question. Sorry. Um, so Andrew Castillo wanted to know, when will be the earliest that we'll see the close-up pictures from Pluto? When will they sort of match those, I guess, the first really nice pictures from New Horizons? Well, I, uh, you'll have to wait for the spring of 2015 for that. Um, we really need to be close, even though we have a spectacular long focal length camera. Um, we have to get within about one astronomical unit of Pluto. And so it's the last few months on final approach. But the great thing is it just gets better and better. What's, what you see that knocks your socks off 90 days out will be twice as good at 45 days out and then twice as good still three weeks out and on and on. Uh, so uh, you'll hold on to your hat, I hope. Uh, once we start, it's going to be a steady rain of data. And as I said, it takes about a year to get it all back. So some of the surprises, some of the best stuff, because we don't know what's going to be best, maybe even come down in 2016. It's a, it's a mission of delayed gratification. So Howard McCalsey asks, is there any anticipation that the science gathered from the Pluto flyby will contribute to regaining Pluto's planet status? It might be. I think when people see Pluto, they're going to they're figure out what a lot of planetary scientists have already figured out, is that the outer solar system the Kuiper Belt region is teeming with small planets. I think if you showed up in the Starship Enterprise at Pluto and turned on the viewfinder, you'd have no question that you're looking at a planet, in fact, a double planet. Uh, and it's hard, hard to be mistaken about that. I mean, after all, um, this is a very large world by, by comparison to almost everything in the solar system. And uh, it is admittedly a new kind of, of, it's a new species of planet, if you will. It's as if um, we had traveled the world and only found uh, large dogs like my Labrador, and never found the Chihuahuas. Or would we say they're not dogs just because, oh, there's too many of them, and I can't keep track of their names, and they're smaller. But you know, when you list the characteristics of the dwarf planets, that they have uh, solid surfaces and atmospheres and seasons and polar caps and cores and many times satellite systems, all the same attributes as the larger planets, except that they're just a smaller version. Not small by human so, uh, characteristics. You know, by human scale, they're gargantuan. Uh, if you try to drive around Pluto in a car, if there was a highway, it would take you many days because the circumference is greater than the expanse of the United States. But they are a different kind of world, and we're getting used to the fact that the solar system made a lot more planets than most of us learned about in grade school. We probably can't remember the names of them all, just like rivers and mountains, or stars for that matter. But um, more and more people are coming to see that, look, these, these are planets. They're just a different category. They're called dwarf planets, like the sun is called a dwarf star. And uh, uh, I just think that the, uh, it was a real tragedy when the press so quickly accepted uh, the unfortunate definition the IAU adopted. Because, you know, if you put the Earth where Pluto is, it's not a planet either. And any time the Earth doesn't pass the planet test, you know something's wrong. Uh, Pamela, you had a question. So, so Ceres, is Ceres a planet or not a planet? Hell yeah, Ceres is a planet, of course. It has all the characteristics of a planet. In fact, um, I have gone full tilt. Um, I don't care where an object is. If it passes the test of 
reading the attributes of the planet, I want to count it. And so I count all the large satellites that are planets that just happen to be orbiting other planets. Just like galaxies orbit other galaxies, the stars orbit other stars, um, we can have a class of planets called satellite planets, starting with Luna, the fifth terrestrial planet that you've heard about for a long time, and then Europa, and Io, and Ganymede, and Callisto, and Mimas, and Titan, and Triton, and go on down the list. The solar system is teeming with planets, and I think that's a cleaner classification system, and uh, I think a lot of scientists are coming in. Just, just hydrostatic equilibrium, and that's your that's your well, role. Well, I have a, 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 like a ball. very nice two-part criteria. It's actually the, the criteria that was recommended to the IAU by its committee, which I was not on. But um, it just says that, A, it's got to be in space, and B, it's large enough to be rounded by self-gravity. Because then it knows it's big. It knows that it's gravity-dominated as opposed to just strength-dominated, like a rock or an asteroid or a comet. And uh, we have a very large size range in planets from about 500 kilometers across all the way up to things even bigger than Jupiter. But, you know, this is an inclusive society. We can get used to this. <laughs> um, I, Emily, I think you've got a question. Oh, you're muted, Emily. Yeah. Uh, Al oh, I'm still muted? No, you're good. Um, okay. Uh, Alan, I've been reading a lot about uh, Kuiper belt, the large Kuiper Belt objects recently, and the more I read, the more I realize how unique Pluto is among the large Kuiper Belt objects, but then all the others are unique as well. So I'm wondering if you could talk about, do we need missions to Haumea and Makimaki and these others in order to learn about the Kuiper Belt, or can we generalize from what we're going to be learning about Pluto? Wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think when we get the data sets from Pluto, we're going we're gonna to be... Uh, uh, really amped up to want more missions to the Kuiper Belt. There's such tremendous variety out there. So many different forms of, um, of worlds. It's, it's, it's just an amazing uh, and completely unexpected finding that um, unlike the inner planets that are grossly similar, the four terrestrials, and the four gargantuan giant planets, that the Kuiper Belt has such a much greater variety of, um, of kinds of worlds in it and, of course, it's very expensive and it's time-consuming to get to the outer solar system. But um, I think the call of exploration is very deep within us. And I think we'll see more missions there. I think we'll see missions that are more ambitious than just a first flyby. We'll see uh, orbiters and eventually landers. Uh, but uh, first we have to get the planetary budget fixed so that we have money to do anything new at all. Right on. I've got a question for you. How much more complicated would it be, would it even be possible to send an orbiter to Pluto, what would it take that would be different from New Horizons mission plan? Um, you could certainly do that, and studies have been made of how to go about that. Um, but, but unfortunately, you know, it took a, it took a 220 foot tall downtown building size rocket to get us moving fast. And to slow us up, we'd take an equivalent rocket at the other end of the line. Um, so you could go on a much slower trajectory, and if you did, you might take 30 years instead of 10 to cross the solar system. But then, with available propulsion techniques, like Cassini and a big fuel tank, you could get into orbit around Pluto or one of the other large Kuiper Belt planets. Um, but uh, from a standpoint of the technology, we really know how to do it. It's really a question of, of will and a question of being willing to wait to take a slow boat rather than a fast transfer out there. Right. Um, oh, Pamela, you had another question. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, is there any uh, future uh, optimal orbital alignment so that we can go as fast as possible out towards Jupiter and Saturn and then use their gravity to, instead of speed, a, speed up a mission, to slow down a mission? Uh, yeah, in fact, um, uh, you, the real alignment that you would like, but it only comes about every 180 years, is to use Jupiter and Saturn to go faster and faster and then to use Neptune and fly by uh, the leading rather than the trailing side to slow yourself up just before you're aligned with Pluto. Uh, but uh, that set of geometries was available in the 1980s and doesn't occur for almost 200 years. I sort of think by then we'll have better propulsion. Uh, yeah. it, it's very hard to do the outer solar system. Uh, it, the time scales are very long, even for very advanced spacecraft like New Horizons to get out there. And Frankly, I'm a proponent, if we do more things in the outer solar system, I think we should sample the variety 
with a number of flybys. Uh, and in fact, missions like that have been proposed uh, to use Uranus or Neptune to guide us to another big KBO as a comparison to the Pluto system. And I think that would be a spectacular mission. Cool. And will this come up for discussion in Beijing? Uh, you mean uh, uh, whether we should do more missions? Uh, the, subject plan of the subject of planets. Uh, I think the IAUs um, uh, sort of missed the mark and they just figure uh, they don't want to be in the press anymore. I don't think okay. it's going to come up, even in 2015, I don't think it'll come up. But you know, it really doesn't matter because it's really just about consensus. It's about what scientists say. We don't normally take votes in science, uh, continental drift, or theory of evolution, uh, climate change, things like that. Uh, we reach our conclusions sort of individually and then there's sort of a phase change. Everybody says, I buy that now. There's enough weight of evidence. We don't go take votes on those things uh, to make it so. And uh, even if we do take votes, it really wouldn't matter very much because we could all vote the sky is green and it wouldn't make it so, would it? it so all of it comes, it, the annoying part is who gets to name the suckers and what naming you know, conventions it, are required. It's just, you know, I think the crowd rules. And I think yeah. that um, particularly since the birth of the Internet and uh, uh, 2.0 on the Internet, um, we're seeing more and more of that. And I don't think this 19th century way of doing things with uh, um, committees of, um, of, of old guys in a closed room who hurry up a decision is the way to go. I think we ought to go with what people think. Uh, Nancy, you had a question. Yeah, um, as if Alan Stern wasn't busy enough with the New Horizons, he's also the principal investigator of the LAMP instrument on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, some people might not realize that. But uh, anyway, Alan, I was wondering if you could just talk briefly about some of the latest findings on LAMP. Oh, great. Um, thanks for asking, because I just came back yesterday from Tucson, where the entire Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter team had one of our science team meetings. And uh, LAMP is discovering great stuff. So are all the instruments. The moon is turning out to be a lot more interesting uh, than our father's generation thought. Um, for LAMP itself, we've discovered strong evidence for exposed water frost on the surface in the permanently shattered regions. Uh, we have the fingerprint of it, and uh, that's a published result. Uh, a non-published result, but one that I talked about at science team meeting that we're just about to submit, is that we've now seen helium in the lunar atmosphere. Uh, this is a big discovery. Um, uh, it's never been seen by remote sensing before. And uh, the next question up is whether that helium is captured helium in the solar wind, or whether it's instead radiogenic um, helium coming from the decay of uh, unstable isotopes inside the moon that's leaking out, sort of the voice of the lunar interior. We don't know, but we know how to find out with more observations how to test it. Basically, we're going to test for the correlation in helium abundance um, that we're observing with the current solar wind conditions day to day. And if they track together, we know it's the solar wind. And if they don't track at all, then it's probably an interior source, an endogenic source. That's, uh, that's next on our plate. We're looking for other gases in the lunar atmosphere, particularly noble gases, because they're so important to understanding the cosmochemistry and the formation of the Earth-Moon system. But um, uh, we're also studying the surface. In fact, with this ultraviolet spectrometer, LAMP is the first uh, instrument in the ultraviolet to map any world, any solid surface in its entirety. So we're learning a lot about space weathering. Uh, we're learning a lot about how geology, geophysics, geochemistry all interact to give us new signatures in the ultraviolet that our other tools in the infrared um, can't help us with. And LRO is in great shape, also proposing an extended mission. It actually has enough fuel to go for seven years or more, and we're hoping that it gets approval to do that. Um, got a couple of questions from Twitter. I thought I would throw these in. So Eric uh, E. Corrigan wants to know, will the Pluto pictures be in color? Some of them will be in color and some will be uh, panchromatic or black and white. Uh, we have a color imager with four color filters on board. Uh, and it takes a red picture, a blue picture, a green picture, and then the, a special composition filter for methane on the surface of Pluto. We can combine those into color. And you may have seen or you can go and Google imagery that we took in the Jupiter system of Io with the Vashtar going off in blue, and beautiful pictures of Jupiter's yeah. cloud systems. And, and we're designed actually to do better at Pluto than at Jupiter. Jupiter was so bright for our cameras being in the, almost in the inner solar system that we could only look at Jupiter from the side when the angular dependence of the light sort of toned everything down. We're really tuned to be far away with very sensitive instruments. And uh, you'll see color of Pluto. 
you'll see color of Charon, Nix, Hydra, P4, and other satellites as well. And Emily, I think, just put up a, a picture that New Horizons made, a pair of pictures of Jupiter's um, volcanic moon Io with that blue um, uh, bit at the top being the Tabashtar volcano going off as we went by in 2007. That is amazing. Yeah. And this image is an example of one where you took the high resolution LORI imager, which is black and white, and you overlay color from MVIC. So you, you get the, um, the benefits of both instruments. What she just said. <laughs> um, so one suggestion from the Twitters, uh, Denison X says to get Stephen Colbert to endorse your stamp for quick uh, quarter million hits, which I think is a really solid idea. So hey, that's a rocking idea. Now I just yeah. have to figure out who I'm one degree of separation from Colbert with. Neil deGrasse Tyson. There's an idea. Yeah, they're they're close. They're tight. So if you can get uh, you get him involved. Uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, no, I think that would that would that would just solve your problem overnight. So I think that's a that's a really good. Well, idea. let's get that's everybody this. That, let's let's get everybody on this um, uh, Google Hangout uh, to Twitter for uh, Colbert to endorse the Pluto stamp. He'll that's get it. That's awesome. And, and before you all start complaining, we do know that the Colbert report is currently on not filming for unknown reasons announced by Comedy Central. We're assuming it's coming back, just like everyone else is hopefully assuming on the Twitter sphere. Right. Um, now, uh, sorry, Emily, you had one question. I think we're starting to run out of time, so do you want to... Yeah, and, and I don't think this is a bad one to, to go out with. Um, going back to the, the planet definition, Alan, and you mentioned that moons, especially I think Titan and, and our own moon, are ones that uh, planetary scientists are constantly referring to as planets. They are. But, but I don't think that the public will ever refer to things orbiting planets um, as planets, and I'm, I, I'm actually very concerned about that because we're now talking about the next flagship missions. We want to orbit, orbit Europa. We want to orbit Titan, and I'm afraid that there's a problem with public public perception about how do we get the public excited about sending things um, to moons of other planets. Surely they can't possibly be as important as the planets. Why are we spending all this money? How would you um, uh, tell the public that, that the, no, the moons really are important? Uh, I think you made a great connection there. And, you know, in fact, many people said to me um, after the IAU's decision uh, that if we had been going for funding for a Pluto mission and that had happened, that we might not have gotten it. I think the point's very very valid with regard to these real important missions to Titan, Enceladus, Europa, uh, even to our moon. And I would, I would say I don't think I have a, an off-the-cuff answer for you, except that the Planetary Society is the largest organization um, out there representing the public and helping to message to and educate the public. And you can help make this sea change happen. You're better communicators than I am, and uh, you have much better channels to communicate through. Thanks, Alan. And I'll help. I'm not, I'm not just handing you the ball back, but I think you guys are the big gorillas. Well, it, it's just amazing to have you uh, to here and joining us this, this week, Alan. I think this was, this was a big step for the Space Hangout. So thanks a lot for, for joining us. And I, really, I know everyone watching this really appreciates you answering questions. And, uh, and this will be available on YouTube, and we'll post it on all of the various places so people can watch it after the fact and, and sort of... I hope that maybe, you know, if there's more interesting things coming down, and especially as we get closer to New Horizons, maybe you'll come back and share some of those pictures with us. I'd love to. You guys were just great, and thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. Can I just say two things to end? Of course, yeah. yeah. First, just a reminder, <laughs> drill that into the ground. And finally, hi, Mom. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Um, now, now, we're going to be doing this again next week, but we've got an interview uh, tomorrow at... Uh, 10 a.m. Pacific with uh, with Mike Brown, who is the yes. Pluto, the Pluto killer. Alan's favorite person. Alan's oh, favorite person. Yeah. Mike's yeah. a great guy. He entertained yeah. my son in his office once, and it was great. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, he doesn't know how to count past um, eight. A little stuck <laughs> on that. We'll ask I, him. I once told him, I said, you know, if we, if we can't have 50 planets, I guess we're going back to eight states, too. And he didn't quite know what to say. <laughs> And it's clearly a, a, a coincidence that we're having him on right after we talk to you. Just oh, it sounds like random coincidence. Yeah, Amazing. yeah. Can yeah. we set that one up too? No, no, no. <laughs>
Um, so we'll be, uh, you know, we talked to the Mars rover driver last week. So, so we've just, you know, we're moving through the uh, the planets and the and the astronomers. So, uh, yeah, and that's tomorrow. So that'll be Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 Eastern, uh, 1800 UTC, and that's going to be here on Google Plus and also on CosmoQuest. And uh, we'll try and give you some kind of warning. And again, that's just going to be a, a Google Plus hangout. Uh, here on Google Plus and everywhere on the internet. So again, thanks to all of my, our contributors and thanks again to Alan Stern for joining us and we'll see everybody uh, here next week, same time, same place. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.